Hey, welcome to the York County History Center. We're at the Agricultural and Industrial Museum, which has 20 exhibits showing 300 years of York County history. I'm really excited because today we're gonna to be taking a look at some of the pieces they have on display for local York transportation. So join us for another lesson on the road. These Conestoga wagons, which hauled goods from Pennsylvania cities, are known for their distinctive curved floors and for their canvas covers, which arched over the wagon itself. The Conestoga River, also known as the Conestoga Creek, is a tributary to the Susquehanna River and runs right through Lancaster County. The word Conestoga derives from the Iroquois language. Before European settlers came to the region, the Conestoga, also known as the Susquehanna or Susquehannock, inhabited the area. These handcrafted wagons were designed for carrying extremely heavy loads over very rough roads. The floor of the Conestoga wagon was curved in order to prevent the goods inside from shifting around too much. The white canvas that covered the Conestoga wagon was soaked in linseed oil to make it waterproof and then was stretched taut over top of hoops in order to keep the goods that were being carried inside the wagon dry. Each Conestoga wagon was pulled by four to six horses, typically horses that were bred in the region. These horses could cover anywhere from 12 to 14 miles a day. Being the driver of the Conestoga wagon wasn't much fun though. You didn't get to ride inside of it. Typically the driver walked alongside the horses while the wagon was pulled. The peak years of use for the Conestoga wagon were the 1820s to 1840s, and they were mainly used on roads here in Pennsylvania, Maryland, Virginia to haul goods back and forth. By the mid-19th century, with the expansion of the railroad lines, Conestoga wagons basically became obsolete. There's a popular misconception that Conestoga wagons were used in migration west, so to Oregon, California, places like that. But really, these Conestoga wagons were much too large and impractical. Instead, prairie schooners were used, which were much smaller. They could travel more efficiently and cover a greater amount of distance in a shorter period of time. This, my friends, is what's known as a velocipede. It was right around the late 19th century, 1880s. The velocipede is essentially an all wooden bicycle with metal tires. That's right, metal tires, kind of like a wagon wheel. They were sometimes known as a bone shaker, more than likely because of the way you felt after you're done riding it. Oftentimes, you guys will see pictures of old style bicycles like this. This became known as an ordinary bicycle. An ordinary bicycle had a small rear tire and a very large front tire. They were known for their speed and they were very popular in the late 19th century. These these ordinary bicycles gave way to what became known as safety bicycles for obvious reasons. Okay, so like Mr. Raymond mentioned, the high wheel bicycle went at a pretty fast rate of speed and it could be pretty dangerous to ride. People got hurt. That gave rise to the safety bicycle that you and I are more familiar with, where we have two tires that are the same size, making for a slower riding experience, but also, as the name implies, safer. Just like in the rest of America, bicycles were very popular in York. In 1909, Red Kleindenst opened up his very own bicycle shop on South Duke Street. Through the years, the store expanded to sell a variety of products. After nearly 100 years of operation, the business closed down in 2008. By 1886, a system of tracks had been laid out in York County, and these horse-drawn carriages or trolley cars provided a much smoother ride other than riding on an ordinary carriage throughout town. Within a decade, you began to see the electrification of these cars, and by 1906, there was over 60 miles of track here in York County with over 67 cars in use. As this system expanded, the railway became a source of recreation for York Countyans. One of these recreational spots was Cold Springs, which runs right through Manchester. This particular trolley car that Mr. Gimby and I are sitting in was abandoned in Do over Pennsylvania in the early 20th century. Before ending up here in the York County Agricultural and Industrial Museum, it resided in many other locations, even attached to a grocery store on Bull Road. We are standing in front of a replica of the York, an early 19th century locomotive. The York was built by Phineas Davis in 1832 for the B&O Railroad. The B&O Railroad was looking for a new kind of steam-driven engine. This particular engine was designed to run on either coal or coke, weigh no more than three and a half tons, and be able to pull approximately 15 tons, about 15 miles per hour. As railroads expanded, so did the need for railroad tools. Today, we're gonna to take a look at a couple of those tools that were used. Now, it's important to mention that we got special permission from the History Center here to handle the tools to show you, but when you come during normal business hours, look but don't touch. 
Working on the railroad wasn't just, you know, sitting on a train car all day. There's a lot of hard manual labor involved on it. So guys would use shovels like this to dig trenches and level roads out. This is a mallet, sometimes called a beetle. It is basically a big hammer made out of either hickory or oak, a very hard wood, held together with iron hoops that was used to drive spikes. And I grabbed this one because I'm not picky, so this will be fine. No, this is a pick. This would help the people with the shovels dig on harder dirt. It would loosen up the dirt to make shoveling easier. By 1900s, advances in technologies led to the production of horseless carriages all across America, and York County, Pennsylvania was no exception. 14 different York County car companies made cars in the early 1900s. Of these, the most successful was the Pullman Motor Car Company. Local entrepreneur A.P. Brummel and York Carriage Company owner Sam Bailey joined forces to develop a variety of vehicles. Each new model made improvements in style, speed, and reliability. Although it only produced cars from 1903 to 1917, the Pullman Car Company and its surviving models represent an innovative time in American history and represent the evolution from horse to horsepower. Right off the bat, we have to thank the History Center here for giving us access to these vehicles. When you come during normal business hours, you are not allowed to go past the rope, not allowed to touch the vehicles. We're not going to touch the vehicles, but we're going to get beyond the rope. So just so you know, when you do come here and enjoy this place, stay on the other side of the rope. So today's modern vehicles are wonderful, and they have many amenities that we take advantage of. When you go to start your car, some cars start with your phone. By the time the car starts, it's running, your seats are heated, your favorite music's playing. You start driving to your destination, you have lane keys keep assists and all kinds of things that keep you safe on the road. You might even arrive to your destination more relaxed than when you started your trip. Back here in 1906 with this Pullman example, things were a little bit different. If you want to take a trip at nighttime, probably your first order of business, or one of them at least, was to come over here and light each gas-powered light and marker light, which means you had to have a supply of gas and you had to have a lighter of some kind, a striker, to light these minor type headlights, which I just learned today, which is really cool. They have a handle here that if you need to take them off, and move them outside your field of vision or in front of you, you can, which I thought was really, really cool. That's step number one. Step number two is setting the brake because if the car does happen to start, you don't want to roll over you. That would be bad. So set the brake here. There's no door or no window. That's actually working to your favor. You're gonna wanna set the timing here, something you don't do in a normal car. Set the timing and retard the spark. Don't advance it, set it to slower. And then set the throttle to, well, I'm not sure in this car, but in every car is a little different. You set the throttle to probably about a quarter to a third of a throttle. Again, you don't want it wide open. And then turn the box here to uh, battery on. You come back to the front of the car. If this car had a choke, you may want to set the choke if it's cold. If you have a cold start, come back over here and find the crank handle. This handle is attached to the crankshaft of the engine directly to the crankshaft. It spins clockwise. So even if you're righty, you're going to want to perform this maneuver with your left hand. Put your left hand under the crank. Keep your thumb off the handle because if this car were to backfire, the handle could swing back and injure you or break a thumb or a wrist. So use your left hand, put your thumb under the handle, and if you're strong, you could stand like this, but if you need a little help, maybe grab a tire or something and pull straight up and over and try to start your car that way. Once the car's running, your job isn't done yet. You come back over here to this side, advance the timing, give it maybe a little bit more fuel, and you will listen for your engine to idle out and smooth. You'd have to know the sound of your own engine. You'd have to know when it was running rough or when it was running well. And by that point, once you have everything secure, you're nearly ready to go. You'd come over here into the driver's area, which I might notice is on the right-hand side of the car. We'll get to that in a little bit. And then you'd activate these pedals and levers. You've got yourself a reverse pedal, a brake pedal, and you've got a clutch pedal that also helps you go forward in different speeds. You notice I didn't say a gas pedal, because again, your throttle is up here on the steering column. So things have become much different from this time period to the cars that we enjoy today. But one thing I'll notice on this early example of a car, the steering wheel is on the right-hand side. We always assume in America that steering wheel's always on the left, but that is not the case. That wasn't a standard thing until about 8, 1908, 1909. We probably have Henry Ford to thank for that with the Model T. The Ford Corporation decided that if we put the steering wheel on the left-hand side, passengers could enter the car more safely from the sidewalk or street area to the right of the vehicle. But back before then, steering wheels might be placed on the right or they might be placed on the left. And just as a quick answer, anecdotal story. I remember my grandmother telling me about times that she'd ride in open air vehicles like this and on a winter day to keep at least their feet warm. Before they'd set out, her family would set bricks in 
the oven, warmed the bricks, set the bricks on the floor back here where the passenger would ride. They put three bricks on the floor per person and slip your feet in amongst the three bricks to keep your feet warm, at least for the short journey, wherever they happen to be going. So here sitting in this 1936 Dodge Brothers truck, you see a lot of things that you and I take for granted today in modern cars. Things like a gear selector, electric lights, a way to start the truck from inside the cab, a gas pedal, brakes in the middle, and clutch on the left. You also have a solid roof. This is just an example of how some cars through the years have changed, but some things still remain the same. For the last stop in the transportation portion of the York County Agriculture and Industrial Museum, we're going to be looking at a 44-ton diesel locomotive built in 1942. This particular model behind me was used during World War II to haul bomb casings. Mr. Graham and I are sitting inside the cab of this 44-ton locomotive, which is kind of cool because this locomotive was designed to fit two workers, which is kind of ironic because it was developed to be operated only by one man. By 1937, agreements were made between the Firemen's Union and the railroad companies that required all locomotives over 90,000 pounds to have two workers in the cab, which meant that this 88,000-pound locomotive was the heaviest locomotive that one man was legally allowed to operate. This locomotive is pretty cool. It operates with two massive diesel engines, one on the other side of the cab here. And in the middle of the locomotive, underneath the floor, those diesel engines supply electricity to a huge, torquey electric motor, making this thing pull like, well, like a train. There you have it, guys. That is just part of the transportation gallery here at the York County Agricultural and Industrial Museum. If you want to see the entire display, and if you want something really nerdy, historical, and scientific, come here and check out stuff here at the Agricultural and Industrial Museum. That's Mr. Graham. That's Mr. Gimby. That's Mr. Raymond. And thank you for joining us on this lesson on the road. We'll see you next time. All right, guys. Where's the ignition? How do we start this thing? Did you, did you put some of the gas in this? All aboard? Diesel. Okay. Ha, ha, ha.